Okay guys, welcome back. So in today's lecture we are going to discuss the portfolio choice problem and uh, we're going to use uh, the tools that uh, we introduced yesterday about uh, the admissible strategies and the convex duality for uh, a portfolio optimization. The first um, thing that we're going to do is to solve the uh, um, portfolio choice problem with constant investment opportunities using the convex duality method. After we have done this we're going to see how to use the stochastic control method, which is going to be applicable both in this case, although it becomes more complicated than necessary, and also in more challenging models in which there is no other choice, essentially. Okay, so let's go back to uh, the uh, main objective here, which is to maximize the expected utility from a portfolio at a certain date in the future. So we denote by x the value of the portfolio under the strategy theta and we are going Meglio? Sì. Va bene così? Sì. Ok. So the objective is to maximize the expected utility from terminal wealth, which we denote by X, of, of corresponding to a certain strategy theta. Okay? So the main objective here is to find the optimal strategy theta and what is the maximal utility that it implies. Okay, so this, of course, is a problem that uh, uh, will have an answer that depends on the assumptions uh, we make on the market and, uh, of course, on the utility function. So, uh, let's go back to what we did yesterday in terms of the characterization of optim optimality. Remember that the first order condition for the optimal portfolio choice problem is to find a strategy such that the implied payoff has a marginal utility which is proportional to a stochastic scan factor. So if we find a strategy and a stochastic scan factor and of course some Lagrange multiplier y which satisfy this equation then we have half solved the problem, the other half is to find the y so that the budget equation is saturated but this is a relatively easier problem because it's a one-dimensional search. Okay. So this is what we want to achieve and this is what we're going to do uh, for the most common models. Okay? So first and most important model is the Summerson model combined with power utility. Okay? So this is the most important model because of the properties that it implies, which are the most reasonable among the tractable models that I'm going to consider here. At any rate, uh, we start by observing that this is a complete market, so there is just one stochastic scan factor, and the stochastic scan factor is given by this expression which we derived yesterday. Okay? Now, what we have here is a power utility, so the marginal utility, which is the derivative of the utility itself, is also of power type, and the power is minus gamma, rather than one minus gamma, which would be the power of the utility function. So, what we end up with when we try to match this first order condition that the marginal utility should be equal to the stochastic scan factor times a constant is an expression of this type. Okay? So, for the optimal payoff, we have to choose a representation. Are we going to take the additive representation in terms of number of shares? Are we going to take the additive representation in terms of uh, position amounts or are we going to take the multiplicative representation? Well, here it is a matter of common sense, okay? So, the stochastic scan factor is an exponential. So, on the right hand side you're going to have an exponential no matter what. There aren't any alternative expressions for this, okay? Not anything that is going to get better at least. So, on the left hand side you want to have something that looks similar so that you can match it and you can compare uh, which corresponds to which. 
Now, here you're going to have to take a power, because this is a power utility. So, when you take the power of some additive representation, it's going to be a mess. Okay? So, the additive representation is just a bad idea here. If you take the multiplicative representation, on the other hand, which is an exponential itself, then when you take the power, you're just going to multiply the exponent by something. And that looks a lot better, of course. Okay? So, here it doesn't take a very deep um, thought to understand which is going to be more promising in terms of the portfolio representations. Multiplicative certainly comes on top. So, now we want to match the marginal utility of the portfolio, which is just uh, the same expression as here, just multiplied uh, on the exponent by a constant, which is this, in fact, with the stochastic discount factor, which is on the first line. So, here, in principle, it's quite confusing, okay, because we have several stochastic terms here, and here we have uh, one stochastic term, other deterministic terms. So, the idea is we have to focus on what is most important, and here we are comparing two random variables, okay? So, the two random variables have to be almost surely equal, okay? So, there isn't much margin for error. In each scenario, what you have on the right-hand side must be the same as what you got you get on the left-hand side. So, the main source of trouble in this comparison is just the stochastic term, okay? So, the, the, the terms with w's are the ones that are going to make or break uh, the comparison. So, if you want to make sure that this term is going to match with this term, you don't get a lot of choice. You must have that this expression must match this expression here. Okay? So, that's all you can do, really. So, if you do this, you're going to get this expression, that pi is supposed to be equal to sigma inverse mu, when you have several assets, so sigma is going to be the covariance matrix of the um, risky assets, and mu is the uh, vector of expected excess returns on the risky assets. And gamma is just a constant, which represents your relative risk aversion here in your power utility. Now, notice, <coughs> sorry, notice that once you have picked this constant pi, this term exactly matches this term. And what about all the rest? Well, all the rest here, because you chose pi to be a constant, this is also going to be a constant, which integrated is still a constant. This is another constant. This is a constant. Constant here, constant here. So, in principle, we still have to make sure that these two constants are the same, but not really, because we still have y, the Lagrange multiplier, which is free to choose, and we're going to choose that in order to make sure that the comparison works out. Okay? So, here, really, once you have chosen pi appropriately, you have one. Okay? And at this point, you also have your optimal strategy, and you can think about it, and uh, uh, you can think about whether the implications are reasonable, unreasonable, or anything in between. As a side remark, notice also that if you have gamma equal 1, you can embed it essentially within this same treatment. So this is a general meta theorem, if you will, that if you can solve a model with power utility, you can just plug the risk aversion to be equal to 1, and you will recover what you would have gotten with logarithmic utility, even though the derivations for logarithmic utility will be slightly different algebraically. But in practice, if you can solve power utility, logarithmic utility is a bonus. The other way around doesn't work. If you solve logarithmic utility, that's a very special case, and the power utility might be massively more difficult. And in fact, the economics is much more complicated with power utility. Now, let's think a little bit about th what this formula means, okay? So, first of all, one implication of this formula is that we have two fund separation, okay? So, what does that mean? It means that if we have, let's say, 1,000 risky assets, we're not really trading all of the 1,000 risky assets, we're just trading this particular portfolio, okay? So, you notice that whatever is your risk aversion here, gamma, the 
the action of this portfolio remains the same as a vector if you change gamma these portfolios are just scaling up or down but they still point exactly in the same direction so the portfolio of risky assets that you are using is always the same so this is really a one fund okay what's the other fund well the other fund that you need is the risk free asset okay whatever you do not put in this portfolio of risky assets you have to put in the safe asset so if you, you if you are given the possibility to trade the safe asset and this portfolio you don't want to trade anything else you do not gain anything if you are given access to all of the thousand assets in the market this is just a distraction all you really need is this portfolio of risky assets and the safe asset itself okay so this is a very important implication and it is also quite robust meaning that if we change utility function if we change the market this implication uh, still holds up in a number of other settings not in every setting we will discuss that later but as long as the investment opportunities are constant essentially the two fund separation remains valid second this formula is important both for what it says but also for what it doesn't say okay what it does not say for example is that the portfolio should depend on the horizon capital T there is no capital T in the formula so is that surprising well to a certain extent yes because it means that the amount of money that you put in the risky assets doesn't really depend on how much time you have left okay so this is more or less the opposite of what you hear in the financial press third what this formula implies it is not immediately obvious from the formula itself but it is an implication it is that if you want to keep the proportion of wealth that you have in the risky assets constant all the times you have to trade a lot okay because asset prices will move when asset prices move they change the proportion of each of them in your portfolio and if you want to push that portfolio that proportion back to where it was you have to trade all the time okay now if you look at all these three implications they are all of them to a certain extent are reasonable first of all empirically if you look at the number of mutual funds they are more than stocks okay so this is not really a two fund separation um, result that we observe in the market in the market the funds are really a lot the second implication of time invariance is also unreasonable to a certain extent because uh, what you hear always about uh, financial uh, planning advice is that uh, if you're young you should hold more stocks if you're old you should uh, hold less stocks is this uh, some sort of uh, wisdom that we distill from the theory mm, not really here okay here the theory says well you are always young you should always keep the same uh, proportion in uh, the risky asset your horizon has no bearing whatsoever so if you're looking for uh, a result like this you have to change something in the assumptions okay third the problem of t having to trade a lot actually gets worse if you introduce transaction costs for example such as proportional transaction costs like one percent of the amount traded what you find is that if you were to follow literally this advice you would generate infinite amount of transaction cost in any interval of time which means that your wealth would plunge instantly to zero if you were to follow this exactly and the way that you can see this is that you can uh, uh, see that the number of shares implied by this constant proportion of wealth is a function of infinite variation and because the transaction costs that are generated are proportional to the variation of the number of shares then your portfolio would immediately drop to zero okay so certainly this is not a piece of advice that we can follow literally in the real world the question is to what extent it is close 
to something optimal when adjusted properly for what we observe in the markets as frictions and uh, costs of trading. Okay, now let's go back to the fear a little bit and let's consider what happens if we change uh, the assumptions uh, in terms of the utility. Now we consider the exponential utility rather than the power utility and the Bachelier model. Okay, so what we know from yesterday is that the stochastic discount factor in the Bachelier model is still the same as the Samuelson model. The two markets were generating different trading strategies, but the same family of payoffs. So what we've got is the same stochastic discount factor. Now, for exponential utility, here we're going to get an exponent of whatever we take as payoff. So what is the best representation we should pick for the portfolio? Well, if we take the uh, the multiplicative representation as we did in the previous case we're going to get in trouble because we get the exponential of an exponential and when we match it with this exponential it's not going to look nice so we're going to take an additive representation which one should we pick the number of shares or the position traded well here you can try both and you see immediately which one is best in this case it is the number of shares okay so you represent the portfolio as the initial capital plus the integral of the number of shares times the price variation, price change, I mean. And when you match it with the marginal utility of your payoff, what you're getting is that using the same arguments as earlier, you should pick a constant theta. Okay? So you see here how critical it is to make a sensible choice in the representation of the payoff. If you choose the right one, sometimes you get a constant strategy that is optimal. If you choose the wrong representation, you get into a, a huge mess. So, with a constant number of shares, the formula for the optimal portfolio now is 1 over alpha sigma inverse mu, which looks awfully similar to the formula we got earlier for power utility and the Samuelson model, and uh, the algebra is in fact exactly the same, but the implications in terms of the economics is, are different. Okay? So, first of all, something that is in common is the two-fund separation. Okay? You see here that also what you are trading is always a multiple of sigma inverse mu, so this does not change. This is the same exact implication. As I said earlier, two-fund separation is one of the most robust implications of this theory. And the time invariance also doesn't change up to a point, okay? Because what is constant now is not the proportion of wealth in each asset. This is not constant anymore. What is constant is the number of shares. Which one is more reasonable? Well, actually, it's more reasonable to have a constant proportion, right? Because to have a constant number of shares is almost irrelevant. One share could be 50 euros or could be 10 euros, why should the number of shares constant here is not really clear, okay? And as time will go by, the price of one share will change, so why should the number of shares remain the same? It's not intuitively clear at all. But this is the implication of this particular choice of preferences and uh, market uh, model, okay? So one attractive, to a certain extent, implication is that if your number of shares is constant, as it is in this model, you don't have to trade at all, okay? You don't do anything. So one of the appealing aspects of this strategy is that it is certainly robust with respect to transaction costs because the transaction costs are zero anyway, okay? Other than the fact that you will have to set up uh, the portfolio at the beginning, but after you do it once, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Okay, now let's look at uh, one last combination. We look at exponential utility, but now with the Summerson model, okay? So in this case, I'm not going to repeat all the uh, arguments. What you have to do is to take the additive representation, but in terms of position amounts, H rather than theta. And what you get is that the optimal strategy is H equal to a constant, okay? 
So in this case, you keep a fixed number of euros in the risky asset. Is that reasonable? Well, it sounds a little bit more reasonable than a fixed number of shares and a little bit less reasonable perhaps than a fixed proportion, okay? But at any rate, this is just what is happening because we have kept the same preferences as before, but we have changed the dynamics of the stock price, okay? So the stock price now is simply behaving in an exponentially increasing way rather than in an additively increasing way. And the amount of risk that we are taking at each time is actually the same as before. It is just that the same amount of risk is carried by a different number of shares. Okay? Now, notice that something that is really odd about exponential utility, both in this case and in the previous one, is that the rich and the poor have essentially the same amount of risk. Okay? So if you have 1,000 euros, or if you have 1 million euros, you are going to hold exactly the same amount of risk. And that's typically something that people are not willing to do because the guy with 1,000 euros would have to borrow a few hundred thousand euros to set up that portfolio and then hold a highly leveraged portfolio, which is not only hard to do, it's actually in many cases impossible because you will not get that amount of credit. Okay? Or vice versa, you should. The, guy with one mil, uh, million euros would have to hold very, very little, just a few hundred uh, of euros in the risky asset, and that's also ridiculous because nobody would hold a one million euro bank account. Okay, so what I want to show you now is how the story changes or how the story remains the same when you introduce not only the optimal investment problem but also the optimal consumption. So, in the previous treatment you were investing today, trading for a certain while and then getting your utility from your terminal wealth. So there was no consumption in the middle. So what happens if you do consumption in the middle? Does your optimal strategy change? Does it stay the same? I want to show you how you can tweak the uh, mechanics of the model to treat also this case and how essentially in the cases that we have considered so far, that is the sum of some model and uh, the constant investment opportunities, the solution essentially remains the same. Okay? So consumption does not invalidate the results of the model. So, the objective that you can consider if you have an horizon capital T is the following. You now do not maximize the utility from terminal wealth. In fact, at the end, at time capital T, there is nothing happening at all. What you maximize is just the expected utility from discounted consumption. Okay? So here you have this parameter beta which is a um, parameter controlling uh, your impatience to a certain extent. So if you take beta equals zero, it means that for you today and tomorrow are exactly equally important. So a certain amount of consumption today or tomorrow will give you the same uh, satisfaction. If you have a positive beta, it means that you have a slight preference for today other than tomorrow. Okay. So in this problem, you have to find two uh, optimal strategies. One is the optimal portfolio, as before. The other is the optimal consumption. And uh, the way, if you look at the objective, actually you do not see the optimal portfolio, you only see the consumption. The only effect of the portfolio is through the budget equation, because the consumption has to come from your wealth, and your wealth is driven by the investment decisions that you're making. Okay? So in this case, what you have is this budget constraint which says that the change in your wealth is equal to your wealth times the return from your strategy, okay, minus 
the consumption stream that you are withdrawing over time. Okay? So this extra term is what we are getting in addition to what we had before from the consumption objective and uh, it uh, changes our mechanics a little bit but in principle there is nothing particularly new here. Okay, So if you want an expression for the wealth at time t after you discount consumption, you can write this as the stochastic exponential of the return process times the initial wealth and this is what we had before, okay, without the consumption and from this you have to subtract the present value using your portfolio return of your fu the future consumption, okay? So this is just a solution to a linear stochastic differential equation which is explicit and it is given by this formula, okay? So nothing particularly original here. Now, what is happening? Here, the budget constraints is going to give us immediately that if we take the portfolio and we multiply it by the stochastic discount factor, we're going to get a super -matigan. Why a super -matigan? Because if you take the budget equation without the consumption, now if you look at the dynamics of x times m, what we saw yesterday is that x times n is a matic, okay? So the drift is zero. Now, if you have a negative drift, the negative drift will only push the what you had as before zero to something that is negative, and therefore you get a super matic. Okay? So what you get is that the expected value of the integral between zero and t of mtct is less than or equal to x. This has also a clear economic interpretation because what is the expected value of mtct? It is essentially the value of your consumption at time t. Okay? Because remember that m is a stochastic discount factor which has the property that when you multiply it by any payoff and you take the expectation, it gives you the price of that payoff. Okay? So the expected value of the integral between zero of capital and capital T of mt ct dt simply represents the price of your consumption plan. Okay? You want to consume at rate ct between zero and capital T, how much does that cost you? It costs you this much. Okay? So this has to be true for any consumption plan. So a natural way to formulate our problem in a duality form is to use a Lagrange multiplier. Okay? So we want to maximize our optimal consumption, okay? the utility from consumption, but we know that we cannot break the bank, we can only afford those consumption plans which cost less than x. So let's add that to the objective with a Lagrange multiplier. So we subtract y, which is a positive number, so we impose a penalty for the amount by which our consumption plant might exceed the initial wealth. Okay? So if we rewrite this as an optimization problem, x times y is a constant, so it doesn't enter the optimization problem. So maximizing this is the same as maximizing this. Okay? And now we have a single integral and a single expectation. And this objective now is an objective that depends on y. So we have a one parameter family of objectives. And we can find that consumption plan CT, which pointwise maximizes this expression. And this will give us a one parameter family of optimal consumption plans and then we will have to choose the one that corresponds to the particular value of y for which we use all the wealth that we have got but not more. Okay? So this is what we're going to do. 
And this is what is going to work when we have a complete market. Okay? Why do we need the complete market assumption here? Because every consumption plan must satisfy this expression for every stochastic discount factor. Okay? But if we solve this problem for a particular stochastic discount factor, there is no guarantee that it will satisfy this constraint for every stochastic discount factor. Okay? The only situation in which we have the guarantee that it works is that when there is only one stochastic discount factor, which is a complete market. Okay? So in a complete market, solving this problem is going to be not only a necessary co condition, but also sufficient for the optimality. Okay? So, if we modify our duality theorem in the setting of a complete market for the consumption case, we obtain the following proposition, which says that if we have a, a portfolio process which satisfies the budget constraint and the first order condition at each consumption time, so we have that the margin utility of consumption is always proportional to the stochastic discount factor times the impatience uh, adjustment, then Phi C, which generates this portfolio, is an optimal policy. How does the proof go? Well, it is just the mirror of what we had earlier. We look at the expected utility from any policy, in principle. We know that this is less than or equal than the expected value of the discounted dual utility this time not of ym but of ym times e to the beta t the, the uh, discount uh, the impatience factor essentially plays the role of an adjustment to the Lagrange multiplier y and this is a quantity that does not depend on ct okay plus the expected value of y e to the beta t mt ct which is what we get from the duality inequality, that u is less than or equal, u of x is less than or equal than v of y plus xy. Okay. Now, the expected value of the integral of mtct dt has always, be, has always have to be less than or equal than x. Okay. So we have this upper bound for the second term, which is independent also of ct. And at the end of the day, now we have that there is a, a priori upper bound which does not depend on C. Okay? So we know that the maximum happiness we can get from any consumption plan cannot exceed this level. So if we find some consumption plan which actually achieves this level, we know that it is the best. Okay? So the argument is the same as yesterday. And uh, the way that we can make these two inequalities actual equalities is to make first this one an equality, and for this we need the first order condition, and then we make this an equality, which requires the budget equation. So the, if we find a consumption plan which matches these two conditions, then we're done, we know that it is optimal, and that's it. Okay? So this is the adjustment that we need for the um, duality theorem uh, to go through. And notice that this also does not depend completeness, incompleteness, this always works, okay? Of course, this is easy to implement if you have a complete market, because then you don't have to guess the stochastic discount factor, because there's only one, and then you can find C by just inverting this equation. If you have an incomplete market, you have to sort of get some uh, illumination to find what is the... Uh, optimal stochastic discount factor and then hope that uh, this will actually work out, okay? So, we'll come to that later, um, how to get the illumination. Now, let's see what is happening if we try to implement this in the simple case of power utility with the Summerson model, okay? And the good news is that it works, the bad news is that it becomes already a bit uh, clumsy, which is sort of signaling that we should probably try to find alternative methods to solve problems that are more complicated. So, the first order condition is as earlier, but now with consumption rather than the optimal portfolio uh, value. 
the stochastic scan factor hasn't changed, so the upgrade consumption is found immediately by inverting this equation. And then we can find what is the exact value function in terms of the Lagrange multiplier y. Now, notice that here, if t is finite, then there is no problem about this being finite. But if t is infinite, which is one problem you can consider, the infinite horizon problem, it's typically uh, a little uh, simpler when you have more complicated models. Then here you immediately have a parametric restriction. Okay? Parametric restriction is that the impatience should be large enough so that it exceeds this right hand side. Sometimes this is very easy to achieve. So, for example, if gamma is greater or equal than 1, then the right hand side is negative. Beta cannot be negative, so it's not a problem. You have always this satisfied. If, however, gamma is less than, less than 1, then the right hand side is positive and the left hand side needs to be more positive. Okay? So, what is going on if this is not satisfied? So this is a typo. This is that, right? Typo. Sorry. Thank you. There should be no little t here. T is, is only for typo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what happens if this is not satisfied? What could go wrong? If you are not impatient enough, why should the problem be ill-posed? Well, what's going on if you are not impatient enough, if you have two patients, is that you will wait longer and longer to consume. And so by waiting longer and longer and longer, you can increase your utility higher and higher and higher. And the reason why there is no optimal strategy when you are two patients is that if you had an optimal strategy, you could always improve it by waiting a little bit longer. Okay? So practically you get a sequence of optimizing solutions in which you defer consumption longer and longer and you get an expected utility which goes higher and higher even to plus infinity when gamma is less than 1 and so you have no well poisonous for this reason. Not because it is bad to be too patient but because the problem does not allow you to consume at infinity. It forces you to consume before infinity, but it is always better to wait a little bit longer. Okay, now, the Y that satisfies the saturation condition is not a problem to find. This uh, can always be um, imposed by calculating uh, CTMT, taking the expectation, and you will find the value of y that works. So what this argument is not telling us is what the investment policy pi should be. Okay, Where does it come from? We have found the optimal consumption, but what about the uh, investment policy? It is nice to have the consumption, but if you do not know how to invest, you will not be able to afford that consumption. Okay, So where is this coming from? Well, this is where the uh, budget contain, constraint comes in, and this is also where the uh, solution becomes a little clumsy. So, what you can do here is to set the budget constraint dxt equals x dr minus c dt. Now, you know everything, so in principle you can just plug the expression for c, and you can get uh, the resulting value of x. And then you will have to impose the condition that at time capital T, your wealth is finished. Okay? And here we are going to see pi explicitly because it enters the expression of xt. So the return is given in particular by this expression with pi mu plus r ds plus the integral of pi sigma dw. And what we are getting when we plug the expression for C and we set the condition that at the horizon, when the horizon comes, the wealth must be consumed completely, is this integral e equation here, essentially. And here you can plug and verify 
that if you take the same pi you had before, then the two expressions are matching. Okay? But this is very unsatisfactory, if you will, because essentially we are just plugging something and checking that it works. But if we had to come up with that expression in the first place, this would not be a very constructive way of proceeding. Okay? Now, this can be improved a little bit, but you see that once you start to include consumption in the problem, then this duality um, approach starts to lose a little bit of its appeal, and we start thinking of alternatives. And this is what we're going to do next. We're going to look at different approach to portfolio choice, which is based on the stochastic control method. Okay? And the appeal of the stochastic control method is that it is very general. It allows you to solve problems for which you don't know anything about, okay? or at least to try to glean some ideas from, uh, about their solutions, if not solving them exactly. And uh, the main ingredient in the stochastic control method is the so-called hamilton jacobi bernman equation. Okay? The hamilton jacobi bernman equation is essentially um, a local version of the first order condition that we have seen in the stochastic, in the convex duality method. The difference between the convex duality method and the stochastic control method is that the hamilton jacobi bernman equation is going to be a condition not on the marginal utility of consumption or of the payoff itself, but rather on the drift of the value function of the problem. Okay? And the value function is precisely what we need to discuss to start introducing the stochastic control method. Okay? One of the appeals, but also the limits of the stochastic control method is that it typically starts with some original sin. Okay? The original sin is that when you write the arbitrary jacobi bernman equation, usually you derive it in an informal way. You do not obtain it as some necessary condition of optimality from some general theorem. Such general theorems exist, but typically they are not general enough to cover the application that you're dealing with. So what is general is the non-rigorous dynamic verbal principle, which is always easy to write down, but it is not rigorous. So after you have written the hamilton jacobi bernman equation, then you have to pay a price for your sloppiness, if you will, and the price is called the verification theorem that you have to check, and which guarantees that what you have solved is actually the problem you intended to solve. Okay? So let's be more concrete and let's look at what is the main idea of the stochastic control method. So the main idea of dynamic programming is that if you want to be optimal all the time, you have to be optimal today and then you have to be optimal later. Okay? So this looks like a philosophical argument, but when you try to write it down, then it looks more operational. Okay? And in fact, it's quite operational. So, Let's start with a concrete problem of uh, expected utility from terminal wealth. Okay, so let's forget about consumption for a moment. Let's focus on the problem in the simplest ingredients. And let's denote by V, okay, the maximum, which for the moment we only know to be a supremum, okay, but let's write it as a maximum in a hopeful way of the problem. Okay? So this is just the maximum expected utility that we can get from the problem. And at this point, we do not even worry about whether this is well defined or not. We want to understand, if it is well defined, what it should depend upon. Okay? So if we have this maximum expected utility, we have to understand what are the arguments of this function. Okay? So what should affect this exp uh, maximum expected utility and what should not affect it. Okay? And this is something for which there is not a theorem. You have to 
figure out what are the variables that enter your application. Okay? So in our case of the Samuelson model or the Bachelier model, there are two main determinants of the expected utility. Okay? The first is how much money you've got, okay? so your wealth. The second is how much time you have left, okay? because if you have no time left, it doesn't matter if there is a great uh, asset with a high risk premium, there is no time to invest in it anyway, so your expected utility will be just the utility of the wealth that you have, and that's it. Okay? Investment opportunities don't matter. On the other hand, if you have 100 years left to invest, then whether the market has a high risk premium or not will indeed make a difference. Okay? So, in this simple problem with constant investment opportunities, so where every day you have the same opportunity to make money, okay, then the two natural determinants of the value function are the wealth and the time left to the maturity of the horizon. Okay? So we conjecture, and at this point this is just a wild guess, that there is a function v of x and t, which is the time, or vice versa, capital T minus T, it's just hyperamortization, okay? Which captures our maximum expected utility. So, one of the few things, in fact, the only thing that we know right now about this function V is that when time is up, when the, time, the horizon has arrived, then this maximum utility is just equal to the utility of wealth, okay? Because there is no more time to invest and the uh, game's over. Now, Let's consider what happens if we choose a particular strategy pi. We're not saying that it's optimal, we're just evaluating the consequences of using a certain strategy pi. And let's also assume, and then again, this is another wild guess, okay? There is no guarantee that this will be true, okay? We are just crossing our fingers and hope that we can pay this intellectual debt later. That the function v which we have assumed to exist, not only exists, but is also regular. It is C2 in wealth, and it is C1 in time. So if this is the case, then we have the license to use Ito's formula. Okay? And if we use Ito's formula on the value function evaluated on wealth and time, what we get is that the evolution of the value function should proceed as follows. It should be <coughs> equal to the time derivative times dt plus the wealth derivatives times dx plus half the second wealth derivative times the quadratic variation of wealth. Okay? So this is just Ito's formula for a function of one diffusion and one deterministic uh, variable. So if we separate the drifts and the diffusion terms after plugging the expressions of dx that we obtain from the budget equation and also the expression for the quadratic variation of x that we obtain also from the uh, budget equation, we separate the change in value into two parts. One part is the diffusion part, the last term here should be dwt. So, even if you don't see the WT properly. But most importantly, we have this drift here. Okay? So, this drift here contains a number of components. They have the time change, then this is the part coming from the wealth derivative, and this is the part coming from the second wealth derivative. Okay, so far so good. Now, what we know is that V at the terminal horizon is equal to u, okay? And now we can use Ito's formula in integral form, so we can write that u, which is the terminal value of v, is equal to the initial value of v, okay, plus the integral of these two pieces, okay? The first piece is the drift, the second piece is the diffusion term, okay? Good. 
So what we have done so far is to write the terminal utility as the integral of the value function over time and with respect to the shocks to the Brownian motion. Okay? So this is just a representation of the terminal utility. Okay, so now let's step past to the expectations of this equation. On the left hand side we have the expected utility, okay, which is actually what we're interested in. On the right hand side, some suspense, we have the initial value plus the expected value of the drift and plus the expected value of the stochastic integral with respect to Brownian motion. Now, since we have already made so many wild guesses, let's make one more. The wild guess we make now is that the expected value of this stochastic integral with respect to Brownian motion is actually zero. Okay? How wild is this guess? It's a little wild, but not too wild, because as long as this is sufficiently integrable, okay, then this will be not just a local martingale, because it is a stochastic integral with respect to continuous local martingale, so it is guaranteed to be a local martingale, but it might also be a martingale. Okay? In fact, all we need is that this is L2. If this is L2, this is automatically a martingale. Okay? Even if it is not L2, if it is L1 plus epsilon, it's still a martingale. Okay, so it is not a totally wild, it is just a little wild guess that the expected value of the stochastic integral is going to be zero. Okay? But let's look at what we can derive if this is indeed the case. If this is indeed the case, we see that the value function here must satisfy that the expected value of the utility at the terminal width has to be less than or equal than the initial value function, okay? Because the initial value function is precisely the soup of this expectation over all strategies pi, okay? But what does it take for this to be true? Well, it takes that this expected value should be always less than or equal than zero, no matter what, okay? And what does it take for this less expected value to be less than or equal than zero, no matter what? Well, there is a lot of stuff inside here, and all this stuff is random. You see this xt here, here? So if you want to guarantee that this expectation is less than or equal to zero for any choice of pi, well, you don't have too much choice but to require that the integral itself should be less than or equal than zero, almost surely, for all pi. Not only you want that, which would simply say that the soup over pi is less than or equal than zero, but if there is an optimal strategy, and we surely hope that there is one, for that particular optimal strategy pi, we would like this to actually be zero, otherwise it cannot be optimal, right? So the soup of this expression should be always less than or equal than zero for any pi, but there should be one pi for which it is actually equal to zero. Okay? All of this is very aspirational, there is nothing rigorous here, but we are looking for a condition that help us identify a candidate optimal strategy, and then we are willing to work with that candidate to make sure that it indeed passes the verification test. Okay? So this is more or less the philosophy of the stochastic control method. You are making a bunch of wild guesses along the way to get a condition that allows you to identify an optimal strategy and then you want to make sure that this is indeed optimal. Okay? So what you see here on the bottom equation is known as the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. And, uh, the derivation we have done has no value as a proof. It is just a heuristic argument. Okay? It is not a stupid argument, but it's not rigorous either. And it is what you typically do whenever you have a new control problem you know nothing about. You, to, you try to write uh, HGB equation such as this one, and you try to solve the equation, 
and if you can solve the equation then you try to prove that the solution is indeed the value function of your original problem okay so if we look at this equation from a differential equations point of view we see that well first of all there is nothing stochastic in here anymore okay now this equation is just a PD okay where the function V is the protagonist or it is the unknown and we are looking for a function V of X and T which satisfies this equation pi here is not a stochastic process anymore this is just the control pi in this particular instant so pi is just a real number over which we are taking this supreme okay so how does this look well in principle this is just a linear equation in v okay but not really because there is a soup over pi okay and if we take the soup over pi and we solve for the optimal pi and then we plug it back in the equation it's not going to be linear anymore okay in fact even in the simplest summerson model the agb equation that you get is very highly nonlinear and if you show it to someone uh, who is an expert of pds he typically will frown upon it okay so how do we make this circuit? how do we solve the how to pay off our intellectual debt well there are two issues that we have to solve right the first is the regularity of v if we don't know that v is regular that's just hopeless okay because all ethos formula is totally unwarranted second we have to make sure that these stochastic integrals are indeed supermatic okay if this is not known also we have not not much to go by so the verification approach is that we're going to guess a v that satisfies the hamilton gobbin equation and then we're going to find an explicit solution okay this is in the simplest case okay if you have an explicit solution well regularity <laughs> either you have it or you don't okay but it's easy to check anyway once you have the explicit solution for v you can check the supermatical property again doing some estimates or yourself to see whether you have the integrability that you're looking for now the limit of this approach is of course that it will work if you, the explicit solution is available okay but when you have it it will do the job okay anyway let's see how it works in this case we start from the hamilton jacobi berman equation in nonlinear form with the boundary condition so it is always important to keep the boundary condition in mind otherwise it doesn't make sense okay you will have completely different solutions to the same uh, hamilton jacobi berman equation in particular the only piece place where you actually find your own utility function is in the boundary okay this hamilton jacobi berman equation works for any utility function Okay, so if you forget what is your boundary condition, you are forgetting what is your utility function, which is not good. Okay, so once you have this, the first thing to do is to get rid of this supreme. Okay, and if you solve here for pi and you plug it back, you find this equation for the optimal pi. From this equation, you already learned something. Okay, in particular, even if you have absolutely no idea about the value function itself from here you already get the two fund separation okay because whatever this is this is a constant okay it is not going to affect the direction of this vector and the direction of this vector has always to be sigma inverse mu okay so two fund separation is really a basic geometric property of this um, problem which has got to do with the constant investment opportunities that are embedded in the Summerson model and also in the Bachelet model. Now, to solve for the optimal pi, here you use this simple expression from linear algebra, you plug it back, and this is now your nonlinear version of the Hamilton Jacobi Berman equation. This nonlinear version, there is not soup, there is no soup anymore, there is no pi anymore, there's just V and its own variables and the parameters mu and sigma. So, what you see here is that 
vt plus ax vx minus a certain constant, which by the way is the squared sharp ratio in your market, divided by 2, times vx squared over vxx is equal to 0. So this term is not a problem. In fact, it's linear. This term is also not a problem. It's linear. And this term is the problem. Okay? Because here you have the first derivative squared divided by the second derivative. And this is as nonlinear as it gets. Okay? So if you look at this as a PD, and uh, you do not think about the properties of the problem, it, it is a bit um, disappointing. Okay? However, the problem, in fact, is not so difficult if you think about what the scaling properties of the problem should be. Okay? So, the scaling properties of the problem should be quite straightforward, in fact, which means that we should be able to capture the dependence of the value function on one variable, wealth, a priori, without even solving the equation. Why is that? Well, suppose that you have twice as much money as me. Okay? Now, we both have the same utility function, x to the power of 1 minus gamma divided by 1 minus gamma. So, what should we do? Well, what you can do, if you see that I am following my optimal strategy, so if you know that I have figured out my optimal strategy, you can simply say, well, I can follow the same exact proportion as Paolo and then what I will get at the end will be the same exact wealth as Paolo times 2 okay? because it's the same strategy multiplied by 2 okay? so if you do that what will you get? you will get my same value function multiplied by Two in this case, lambda in general, to the power of 1 minus gamma, because that's how utility works. We have a power utility, the, ut the power of 2 times something is the power of 2, to that power times something to that power. <coughs> so if you are doing this, is this going to be optimal for you? Well, it has to be, because if it weren't, then I should be able to increase whatever I am doing already by just following whatever your optimal strategy is and dividing it by 2. Okay? And then that would be optimal and it would be better than what I have. So this cannot, since this cannot be better because what I'm doing is already optimal, then it, if you follow exactly what I'm doing, it will be optimal also for you. Okay? So this scaling property already tells you the dependence of the value function on wealth. So it tells you that v of xt should be of the form x to the power of 1 minus gamma divided by 1 minus gamma times v to the t. Now, do you really have to believe the argument that I just gave you? Not even that. You don't even have to believe the argument. You only have to give it a chance. You only have to say, look, I'm going to give this function the opportunity to solve this equation. Okay? If it does, that's great, okay? I don't have to believe Paolo's argument anyway. So, let's do it. So, if you believe that this could be the value function, then you can calculate the partial derivatives in terms of the function little v, which is only a function of time. Then you can plug it back into the original equation, see how it simplifies as an equation in little v only, and this is what you're getting. This is just a tame linear ODE in little v, with a single terminal condition, Vt. This is, in fact, a first order ODE. So, with one terminal condition, you're done. You find immediately what the solution is, and the solution is this, okay? Little Vt should be the exponential of a constant times the time to maturity, okay? Does this make sense? Indeed, it does make a lot of sense, because it is saying that the value the time value of investing is growing geometrically in the time to maturity. Okay? So if I give you no risky assets but only uh, risk-free assets and I give you twice as much time to invest as me, 
what are you going to get? Well, you're going to get the interest rate compounded twice, okay? So it will increase dramatically in the horizon. When you have risky assets, it's going to be more complicated because you're not going to have only the risk-free rate here, but also some other term. But it's essentially the same story. Your value function should grow over time exponentially with your horizon because the, the value of investing keeps compounding over time. Okay, That's more or less the intuition. And the value of investment is proportional to this expression, which is the square sharp ratio, divided by your risk aversion, which also makes sense because if you are very highly risk averse, you are not going to put a lot of money in the risky assets, so this term will be quite small, and indeed you will keep most of your money in the risk-free rate. If in the, instead you are very risk tolerant, so your gamma is small, this term could be actually quite large. Okay? So, this is the solution. Now, how do we know that this, which at this point is only the solution to a partial differential equation, is also to the, to the, the solution to our own initial expected utility maximization problem. Well, let's do it. Yes? Is it a certain unique for this type of model? Well, what we know right now is just that this solution solves this PD. Okay? So, we do not know anything about uniqueness. We could probably find something from uh, the theory of uh, partial differential equations about uniqueness, but we're not even doing it because what we want to do now is to prove that this is the value function. If we prove that this is the value function, then we do not care about the uniqueness anymore because even if there are other solutions to this partial differential equation, they're not good because they're not the value function. We do not care about the partial differential equation per se. We only care about the value function. So once we have something we believe is the value function, we're going to verify it, and if we succeed, then we forget about everything we did before. Okay? That's more or less the philosophy of this approach. Okay. So the way we the theorem goes as follows: it simply says that the value function that we have guessed by doing a lot of uh, pacts with the devil along the way is in fact the value function of the problem and along the way we also got the what is the optimal policy which we had obtained from the expression of the value function itself okay and not surprisingly it coincides with what we obtained already from the convex quality approach so the solution we have guessed is regular okay so we can use ito's formula without fear and we can state that the expected value of any policy is equal to the initial value of the value function plus the integral of this drift and the integral of this diffusion. Now, what's happening here? The first integral is always less than or equal than zero because the integrand is what is inside the soup in the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. And we know that the, hamilton the solution to the hamilton jacobi bellman equation okay. satisfies that equation, and in particular the soup is less than or equal than zero. So the, the drift is certainly less than or equal than zero. The diffusion, we don't know yet, okay? So we know that u of x minus v of x zero is less than or equal than integral between zero and capital T of the stochastic integral. Now, at this point, however, we know what is Vx, so we can plug it, okay? Now, here, um, there should be a dWt, which didn't fit. Sorry about that. Now, all we have to check at this point is that this integral is a supermatting, okay? Now, what we know for sure is that this is a local matting because it is the stochastic integral of a uh, Varnier motion, which is a continuous local matting. Now, at this point, we're going to look at what happens for gamma less than 1, okay? For gamma greater than 1, the argument is more cumbersome, so I will not do it. But here I just want to give you a proof of concept, okay? Then we know that u is necessarily positive, 
okay? because gamma is less than 1, so this is positive, and the numerator is, of course, positive. So we know that u is greater or equal than 0, and we also know that u is less than or equal than vx0 plus this integral. So this integral is a local martingale greater or equal than 0, almost surely. So it's a super martingale by what we showed yesterday. Okay? And since it is a super martingale, then we know that the expected value of this left hand side is always less than or equal than 0, and therefore we know that v is the value function. Okay? So in this case, you see the verification is very easy. In reality, when you're solving some new problem, this is not nearly as easy, okay? But the philosophy remains the same, okay? You try to find something that looks like a value function by doing a number of non-rigorous tricks, and then you set yourself with the goal of proving that that quantity is indeed the value function by verifying it. Okay, so what we're going to do next, if you don't have any other questions, is to try to make the stochastic control work in more generality. Okay? Now, the appeal of the stochastic control is not to use it with the Merton problem, for which we had already solved it with convex duality in a more elegant and less messy way. It is to solve problems that we cannot solve otherwise. Okay? And these are the problems that you get when you consider stochastic investment opportunities. So, what are stochastic investment opportunities? Well, they are essentially what are investment opportunities. Well, investment opportunities are essentially two things, okay? One is the interest rate. The interest rate is the simplest part of the investment opportunity set. The interest rate in the model, the sum of some model we consider, is constant. In reality, it typically is not constant. So if you live in a decade in which the real interest rate is very low, your wealth will not increase very quickly. If you live in a decade in which the real interest rate is very high, your wealth will increase much more quickly. So if you live in the second world with a higher real rate, you will be able to consume more, other things equal. Okay? So this is part of the investment opportunity set. If the rate is constant, that's one thing. If the rate varies stochastically, that's another thing. Now, the risk premium is also another part of the investment opportunity set. So even if you have a single asset, whether you are getting 8% expected return for 10% volatility is one thing. And if you're getting 2% expected return for 10% volatility, it's another thing. Of course, it's a lot better to live in the 8% expected return for 10% volatility environment than in the other one. Okay? In practice, the uh, risk premium will also move around over time, and that is going to be another source of um, changes in investment opportunities. Now, if you look for the empirical evidence, then about the interest rate, this is pretty clear because the interest rate is observable directly. If you're looking for evidence on the time varying of risk premium, there is also some of that, because there are a number of variables that have been identified empirically that help predict future returns. Okay? If you find a variable that helps predict future returns, meaning that the conditional return, the conditional distribution of future returns depends on the value of this variable, okay? then you have found evidence that returns are not IID. And because constant investment opportunities imply that returns are IID, then this means that the, the investment opportunities are not constant. Okay? So that's more or less how it goes in terms of evidence. The most famous example is the dividend yield. Okay? So if you look at the aggregate dividend yield, you see that when the aggregate dividend yield is high, then typically future returns are also higher, 
and when the uh, dividend yield is really low, then future returns are typically uh, lower than average. Okay, so you can discuss about the statistical significance of that, and it's uh, relatively controversial. But at any rate, there is some evidence that this is a variable that helps predict future returns, and there are many others as well. Okay, so. Notice that this does not have anything to do with arbitrage, okay? The fact that returns are partially forecastable does not imply any arbitrage in the market. And in fact, you can simply write models in which future returns are mere averting. They do all sorts of uh, strange things that have nothing to do with independent returns. And still, there is absolutely no arbitrage. And the way that you check it is that you exhibit explicitly a Martingale measure, once you have a Martingale measure, the arbitrage is gone, okay? Cannot exist because of the argument we introduced yesterday. No admissible strategy, if you have a Martingale measure, will ever give you an arbitrage. Okay? And if you do non-admissible strategies, they don't make sense because you can do an arbitrage even with a burning motion. Okay? So, let's look at a general version of a diffusion model with stochastic investment opportunities, okay? So, this is too general to be useful, but uh, it's general enough to prove a theorem, so you can specialize it in your particular application by choosing the various uh, ingredients in the model. So, we're going to take a model with D assets, okay? All these assets are driven by, uh, are driven by returns which follow two pieces. The first piece is just the usual interest rate, okay? The usual interest rate we are going to assume that depends on some state variable that did not exist in the previous discussion, and we call by y. Okay, so y is basically anything that on which investment opportunities depend. So y summarizes the state of the world, not the state of your portfolio. Y does not include information about your wealth. It only talks about what's happening in the market. Okay. Whether the interest, it determines the interest rate, it determines the excess returns, the volatilities, and even the correlations. Okay? So, the second part of the return is the excess return. So, each asset, I, and we have D risky assets, will have an excess return, mu I, which has the expected excess return component, mu I, actually, and the noise or the shock which is the sum of sigma j, which is a function of y, times dzjt, and z here is a burning motion, okay? So zj represents the shock corresponding to the jth burning motion, okay? So we have D different shocks, which do not correspond necessarily to each asset. So each of the shocks ZJ will affect each of the asset uh, returns RI, okay? But the exposures of asset RI to the shock ZJ is sigma IJ, okay? So this is just the volatility shock matrix sigma IJ. How does the investment opportunity set move around over time? Well, it has its own dynamics. It will have a certain drift B, okay? And it will have some other matrix of shocks A, but the shocks to the investment opportunity sets are different from shocks to the assets themselves, okay? So we have another bunch of Banyan motions, which we denote by W, to separate them from the Banyan motions which affect the asset returns. And these are K, okay? K is the same dimension as the variable Y. So Y is a variable with K dimensions. We'll have, you will be, you will need K numbers to summarize the state of the market. And what you've got here is that also the correlations between the shocks to the investment opportunity set and the shocks to the assets are given by these functions, rho ij, which can also vary over time, okay? So, the model itself has a lot of ingredients, there are a lot of moving parts. 
You have stochastic interest rates, stochastic volatilities, stochastic investment opportunities, stochastic risk premium, stochastic correlation. Everything is stochastic. Okay? In practice, when you study a particular model, only some of these components will be turned on. But in principle, there is no reason why uh, to simplify the model at this level because it will not make any difference when we have to prove a theorem. Okay. So, last definitions we are going to define by big sigma, as before, the covariance matrix of the asset returns, okay? By big A, the covariance matrix of the state variable shocks, okay? It is the same exact uh, counterpart as big sigma, but for the states. And by Y, capital Y, the covariance matrix between the as the return shocks and the variable shocks. Okay, so we're going to call Y the state variable, and we're going to call R the returns. So if you have any questions, this is a good time because I will use the notation as we move forward. The Z are independent. The Z? Yeah, these are uh, all. Uh, IID by emotions, the Z's, and also the W's, okay? So these are all on their own. These are the basic ingredients as shocks of the market. And then we mix them up using the sigmas, the A's, and the O's, okay? Okay, so the first question one has to settle after writing this model is very basic. Does it exist, okay? Because it's nice to write it, but uh, uh, it's even nicer to know that it makes sense. But so, yes? I have one more question. Is that, for example, all the coefficients does not depend explicitly on time? In no, in this model, no. But uh, actually, you can do that. Um, all you have to do is to take uh, one component of y to be time. Okay? okay? Now, strictly speaking, this is not going to satisfy the assumptions. I will make uh, one or two slides later. But if you have to do this in practice, it changes absolutely nothing. You have to separate that variable and treat it uh, uh, on its own. And then uh, you can treat the others uh, in the same way that I will treat them here. I will just assume that they are all stochastic and therefore that their covariance matrix is strictly positive definite because then I can do the inversion of the matrices uh, when uh, we do the algebraic calculations, but there is no loss in generality in considering also dependence on time. One of the reasons why I'm not considering dependence on time here is that uh, later on I will want to uh, consider the longer eyes on asymptotics and when you consider the longer eyes on asymptotics, either the, de the dependence on time vanishes or it becomes uh, explosive and so the problem does not make sense in the limit. But for most models actually there isn't dependence on time, uh, the models that you see in the literature. Let me give you a couple of examples. Simplest example of, simplest non-trivial example of this model is probably the model you get with so-called predictable returns. Here you turn off everything except for the drift that you leave to be stochastic. You only have one asset here. The drift is just an einstein lunenberg model. Okay? You take these two body motions, for example, to be independent. This is just the simplest assumption. So here you have y, which is moving around 0 with a certain mirror version rate lambda. And this y is precisely the expected return that you get from the market today. Okay? The interest rate is 0 in the simplest version of this model. And so what you are facing now is a market in which there are good times where the y is particularly away from zero. Um, even if it is negative, it is good because you can short and make a lot of money. Okay? It is bad only when it is close to zero because then your optimal position is to stay out of the market, so you don't make any money from that. Okay? So this is the one version of the model. Another version of the model is where you take stochastic volatility, for example. You can take Y to be a cox singer uh, um, model or a fair diffusion, as you want to call it. So Y will uh, move around theta 
and away from zero. Of course, you have to make some parametric restrictions to make sure it doesn't hit zero, but that's the usual stuff. And then you can put y here as the squared volatility and also as a proportion to the spin. Okay, so here you get a simplest portfolio choice model with stochastic volatility. I will show you how to solve this model later. And uh, uh, you can see immediately that models such as these ones perfectly make sense because you can derive immediately what is the solution. Here you know that the austin Nuremberg process exists, okay? And here you can solve this explicitly in terms of why, okay? So you know that this model certainly makes sense. This model, you can also prove directly that it exists. So on a case-by-case -case basis, actually, the well posedness of the problem is never an issue. In generality, you have to uh, assume something, and I will tell you about that. But before we talk about the, expo the well posedness, let me um, discuss something about the qualitative properties of these models. So one central ingredient that should be the focus of one's attention is this quantity here. So what is this quantity? Well, essentially this represents the covariance of the hedgeable state shocks, okay? So what are the hedgeable sh sh state shocks? The states, the state variables, are not tradable, okay? So think of the dividend yield. There is no way to replicate the dividend yield because it's not a price, okay? There is nothing traded that represents that. Take something else, some accounting measure. There is nothing traded that represents that accounting measure. Okay, but so, however, the shocks to these non tradables might be correlated to some tradable assets, okay? So, if they are correlated, they are probably hedgeable, at least in part, okay? The most brutal approach would be to run a linear regression of the state shocks as a dependent variable with the um, asset shocks as independent variables, see what are the coefficients implied by this regression, and whatever coefficients you get, they will uh, represent uh, the exposures to a portfolio of tradables to partially replicate an untradable. The R square that you get from that regression will represent the percentage of variance that you can hedge from those tradables. So if you get 100% R squared, it means that this is perfectly hedgeable. If you get 0%, means that totally uncorrelated, it's hopeless. Anything you get in between is a measure of partial hedgeability, if you will, okay? So, this quantity, epsilon sigma inverse epsilon, represents the covariance of the hedgeable state shocks. And it can vary along a spectrum of values. So, if this is equal to the covariance matrix itself of the state shocks, which is big A, you are in the case of a complete market. Complete market means that even though the investment opportunities are moving around a lot, okay, actually they are moving in a way which can be perfectly hedged by taking positions in the market. Okay? So practically what this means is that the Brownian motions W's have shocks which are locally spanned by the Brownian motions Z. Okay? That's the extreme case of a complete market. The other extreme case is what you can call in this setting a fully incomplete market. So what does it mean fully? It means that any covariance of any state shock with any asset shock is zero. Okay? So it's hopeless. Anything you try to predict, it's impossible to predict. All the R squares of any aggression of any state shock against all the assets are zero. Okay? So this is a situation in which the state shocks are moving, the states are moving around a lot, but there's nothing you can do about it. Okay? So no portfolio will have any correlation with any of these movements. So in particular, if you go back to those examples, this is a full incomplete market. Okay? Because this burning motion, which is the asset shock, and this burning motion, which is the state shock, are uncorrelated. So any portfolio construct with this market will with this asset will be uncorrelated with this, okay? Okay. 
Now, anything in between is not hopeless, but it's not perfect either. Okay? So if you have a single state, so if your y has dimension 1, so if k is equal to 1, then this number is actually, this quantity is actually a number, and you can represent it as rho prime rho, and this represents exactly the r squared of the regression locally, the state dependent regression of the state against all the assets. Okay? So this gives you a scalar measure of completeness, okay? which varies between 0, which means fully complete, and 1, which means complete. Okay? So notice that this is a notion that does not make sense in full generality. It makes sense for this class of diffusion models, which, however, is relatively general, um, practically speaking. Okay, so what we're going to do here is not to use duality, not yet at least, but to make a few pacts with the devil of stochastic control to get a hamilton jacobi bellman equation, which can actually give a solution. Okay? And then we're going to try to work with that solution to prove that it is the optimal um, value function. So, first thing is that we're going to write the HGB equation as we did earlier. And what we're going to get here is a nonlinear PD, and uh, it's not going to look nice at all. Okay? So, to simplify this, we're going to make a few tricks. So, here you can branch in different directions. One is to use a power transformation, which makes the PD linear. This will work basically when you have one state variable and the correlation doesn't change. Okay? Then you can do this. Another way is to reduce the PDE to a system of ODEs. Okay? If this works out, it's a great deal because having two PDE ODEs is a lot better than having a one uh, PDE in two variables. And for this also, we're going to need some assumptions. And an alternative to this is to do a log transformation. Okay? Sometimes also this one works. And another possibility is to look for the longer horizon limit. Okay? And then to content ourselves with strategies that are good only when you're young. Okay? So that, that are accurate only when you are far away from the horizon, essentially. And this will work in many cases. Okay? But at the end, what we want to do is, in these cases, the verification is not a big deal. It essentially mirrors what I showed you earlier. In this case, with the longer horizon, the verification is substantially different because we are going to further change the problem. And this I'm going to show you how to do. And when we do the verification here, we are going to actually bring back the duality approach that we discussed earlier. And we're going to see how it helps us actually plug the holes that stochastic control leaves around. Okay? So duality and stochastic control are a sort of symbiosis with each other. Stochastic control can get you a candidate in many cases, and duality helps you make sure that that candidate actually works once you have it. Okay, so first of all let's ask the basic question about the value function. What does, should it depend upon? Well, it should certainly depend upon it, what, what it was depending earlier, which was time and wealth. Okay, no question about that. But it should also depend on the state now, because, you know, Whatever the interest rate or the risk premium are going to be today is going to, ma to matter on what the uh, value function is going to be going forward. So, what we're going to do is again to use Ito's formula on the value function, assuming and hoping that it will be regular. This time it becomes more complicated because we have two diffusions, x and y. So, we get two first order terms as earlier, but now we don't get one second order term, we get three because we get the quadratic variation of x, quadratic variation of y, and the cross variation of x and y. Okay? Nothing surprising here, this is just Ito's formula. 
So notice that these are vectors, okay? So V, Y is a gradient essentially. V, Y, Y is a Hessian. V, X, Y is also a gradient, okay? Because X is a scalar and Y is a vector. I'm going to write them like this, otherwise they will not fit in the slides. They do not fit in the slides anyway. Okay, now the budget equation, as usual, is that the change in wealth should be equal to the interest rate plus the exposure to the risky assets times the risk premium and plus the volatility times the exposure. So the drift of this value function, once you collect all the pieces that are coming out from the second order terms, is actually equal to this quantity. What you see here is that this is linear, this is linear, this is linear and it's going to stay linear because here there is no control, the only control we've got is pi and the only terms that are going to become non-linear are the ones where pi is present, okay? So this will not be a problem. This will not be a problem either because there is no pi here, okay? This is just, these are just the two terms that drive the dynamics of the state variable itself. The terms that are going to generate non-linearity are here because here you see that there is a pi and here you see that there is a pi squared, okay? So what we're going to do next is take the supremum of this over pi and when we take the supremum of this over pi we see that something's going on, okay? Even before we actually solve for the value function v, which is not going to be a piece of cake, we see that geometrically there is something happening that was not happening before. What we had before was just this term, okay? And what I argued earlier is that from this term alone, even finding, without finding the solution of V, two fund separation was guaranteed, okay? So now we also have this other term, and therefore we don't have two fund separation anymore. So what do we have? Well, let's look at this. First of all, let's look at the dimension of this extra term. This Epsilon, remember, is not a vector. This is a matrix. Okay? It is a n by k matrix. So, sigma inverse, which is uh, uh, n, sorry, there's no n here. There's d, which is number of assets, and k, which is number of state variables. So, this is a d by k matrix. This is a d by t, b, d by d matrix. So, this is a d by k matrix. So, essentially, this is a linear combination of several columns, k columns. Okay? So, how many funds are we getting in this market? Well, we're getting one, which is the risk-free asset, two, which is the myopic portfolio we had earlier, okay, and k more. We get what is known as the k plus two separation, okay? So, what is the k plus two separation? It is the, the composition of all optimal portfolios. Notice that here, the, the utility function doesn't even matter, okay? Because we haven't used the boundary condition yet. This is just a local condition we are getting on the value function, which holds regardless of utility function, okay? So, why do we have these additional K funds? What is the purpose of these funds? Well, if you look at the expression, it holds a clue, okay? What is this? quantity sigma inverse epsilon. Well, if you look at the expressions for the optimal estimators in a linear regression, you see that this is precisely the projection of the vectors epsilon okay, on the state shocks. Okay? In other words, Sorry, of, these are the projections of the state shocks on the asset shocks, okay? So, if you are running the regressions of the state shocks on the asset shocks, you will get that these are precisely the coefficients in this regression, okay? So, what does this mean? It means that whatever you want to do to hedge these state shocks, whether you want to hedge all of them, a part of them, you should always take multiples of these k vectors, 
Okay? And these k vectors are the only ones that are ever going to be optimal to predict these state shocks. So this is known as the intertemporal hedging portfolio. And it is important because the reason why you buy such a portfolio is not that it makes money. In fact, it can lose money. Okay? If you look at the expected returns on these portfolios, it can well be negative, and it, there's nothing wrong with, wrong with that. The reason why you buy these portfolios is that they help smooth out the effects of time-varying investment opportunities. Okay? So having time-varying investment opportunities is one potential source of noise. Okay? If you are risk-averse, you don't necessarily like noise. So you may want to hedge against changes in these asset, in these state shocks. The way you hedge these changes is by buying these portfolios. Okay? So this is important economically because it gives a different reason to buy assets than just the expected return. Okay? You're not trying to make money from these portfolios, you're trying to reduce risk. Okay? So the weights will depend on miscalculation? The weights are the big difficulty, okay? Uh, because then you have to find exactly what is the risk aversion, and there is no guarantee that the weights will not be zero, okay? Everything that I'm saying right now would be uh, quite ridiculous if it turns out that the weights are zero, okay? The weights will be zero for logarithmic utility, but in general they are not, okay? And the no, if you are risk neutral, there is no solution to the optimal portfolio choice problem because you should take infinite leverage, right? This is happening also with uh, the Samuelson model because there is one over gamma. The the point here is that okay, sorry. So let's look at when you don't do this when there is no. Intertemporal hedging. Well, there are two cases where you don't have intertemporal hedging. One, you don't want it. Two, you want it but you can't have it. Okay? So, the case where you can't have it is the easiest. Because if y is equal to zero, full incomplete market, if all the covariances are zero, whatever you want, what you want is determined by this coefficient here. You can't have it because it gets multi multiplied by zero. Okay, so your wishes are no, not heeded here if y is here. But this is something about the market. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay, if there are no covariances around, well, somebody should improve the market, come up with something that covariates with the state variables and complete it. But if the market is as it is, that's it. Now there are other cases where instead this is not. <coughs> even wanted, okay? So even if it is possible to hedge, you don't do it. When does that happen? Well, when Vy is equal to zero, for example. When does Vy equal to zero happen? Well, one trivial case is Merton, okay? Merton corresponds to the case where Y is a constant. If Y is a constant, which means that the state is always the same, okay? It means that Vy in particular is zero. And if Vy is zero, then you see that you don't want any hedging, okay? So you can see also from this argument that they basically this is about hedging the state. It's not about uh, any risk premium. The fact that it is not about risk premium, you see directly from here, from the fact that the direction of these portfolios does not depend at all on the risk premium. Mu is here, but it, there is nothing like that, okay? Mu is not here. You can change mu, this will change, this will not change, okay? So changing the risk premium here does not affect these directions. It will affect, of course, these coefficients, and that's what we have to deal with, okay? The other case where you do not want to hedge at all is a very special case, and we are going to discuss shortly. It is the case where gamma is equal to 1. Gamma is equal to 1 is about logarithmic utility. The logarithmic investor is a very, very special investor who does not care about the future, okay? Only cares about the next epsilon of time, pretending that 
investment opportunities will remain as they are forever. And then when they change, he takes notice of this change, but he doesn't care about any future changes. Okay? He's a guy who lives every day as if, if to were the last one, okay? in a philosophical expression. So if you look at the Hamilton Jacob Bilbao equation here, what you get after you take the supremum over pi is that this is the expression without the pi. You see that these are all linear, and this is the big nonlinear term that we get as before. The novelty with respect to the constant investment opportunities are given by these two terms, which make uh, the nonlinear term more complicated, but you know, qualitatively, it is not worse than earlier. It is not worse than before because this is still of the same type of nonlinearity. The big problem is that now we have a lot of independent variables. Okay? So before we had x and t, then we were able to get rid of x and then to solve for t. Here we have x and t and y, and y has k dimension. Okay? So here we have to do something to reduce the dimension. So we learned from the previous case, and we still can do the trick on the wealth dependence if we are still working with power utility. Okay? And this is going to make our life easier. We do the same substitution as before, and we can simplify the optimal portfolio. Here you see that we already obtained the Merton portfolio from the first component. The second component, however, refuses to simplify. Okay? It simplifies just a little, but here we still have the reduced value function v, which is a function of both t and y. Okay? And if we want to fully understand what is happening in the intertemporal hedging, we have to find v itself. So the intertemporal hedging part is more complicated because it depends a lot on the um, dynamics of the state variable. Okay. So, if we simplify the AGB equation here, what we obtain is now this PD, which is in k plus two, k plus one, sorry, variables. One is t, and the other k's are the values of y. Okay? So, this is still quite nasty because of this nonlinear term, and we need to do something about the nonlinear term, otherwise, it will never work. So, what we can do, can we do about this? So, first out is the logarithmic transformation. Logarithmic transformation means that we reduce further v, and now we call it e to the w, and now we rewrite the func, the PD for w rather than v. Okay? What we get from here is this equation, which This is nice because this is not even depending on w. Okay? This is just a function of y. This is linear. This is linear. This is linear. This is non-linear, but not as bad as before. You see that there is no denominator anymore. There is no wyy. There is just wy squared. The optimal portfolio here simplifies somewhat, not really, because we still have the dependence on the value function. But now we can use this to take guesses. Okay? And guesses are our friends in stochastic control. And in particular, there is a large class of models which can be solved with so called quadratic guesses that depend on time. Okay? And these are known as the fine quadratic class of models. And for example, any model in which the state variables are Linear, have linear drifts and constant volatilities, and the state variables themselves are Ernst and Ullenbeck multivariate Ernst and Ullenbeck models. They can be solved explicitly with a quadratic guess like this. The, not only in the long horizon, but even for a finite horizon. Okay? And the verification theorem is not particularly difficult. So I will close it here for today. Tomorrow we are going to continue uh, this discussion, and then I will show you also the verification theorem, and um, I will take it from there. No, mm, depends. So when you, when you do the to the power well, this, yeah, this, is, uh, yes, because what we have done here is to make it positive anyway. So big V doesn't have to be positive because if you have gamma greater than one, it will be negative, in fact. Okay, but if you factor out one minus gamma, 
this will take care of the negative sign. So when gamma is positive, this doesn't do anything. When gamma is sorry, when gamma is less than one, doesn't do anything. When gamma is greater than one, it will adjust. And then what is left is always positive here. And at this point, you can take the uh, log, and it's not a problem. Right? It's not really an assumption. No, I mean here at, at this level, we are at the level of solving the the AGB equation. So we are not even taking uh, the tab of the assumptions. We just want a solution. Once we have the solution, then we're going to look at all the assumptions and we're going to look at what we need to do the verification. Okay. But technically we do not know, even know that the model is well posed if you have a general setting, right? Any other questions? Okay, so see you tomorrow. So tomorrow it will be at 9 in uh, Aula Bianchi, I believe, right?